with more particles Hey, truth be told, it's Captain Ron here with Tony Sweet, and we have a show for you today like you wouldn't believe. Buckle up for this one. I'm telling you, I'd like to start the show off a little bit differently. Normally, we jump right in, like I said, with the uh, guest, but we're going to hear my long-winded introduction this morning. Here we go. And uh, <laughs> we've got, I've actually got notes and homework, and I've wow. prepared for a show, which is a, a very unusual thing. We never have that. I'm flattered. But I have specific questions that I need to ask this gentleman. And I'm going to also uh, include my personal experience in this topic, and this is a big one. If what we're about to discuss in tonight's show is true, it's bigger than alien visitation. This is, this is as big of a topic and as big of a question as there is in the world, right? What happens after we die? Uh, anyone who ever listens to the show also knows that you know we're open to these topics. I'm certainly open, but I'm, I'm a little uh, skeptical about the afterlife, the spiritual realm. I listen, and I'm open. But often I walk away feeling that was really hokey or just not too wacky for me. It's, uh, you know, people come up to me and I, I can feel your aura and I see your chakra and I, and I see dead people. And the truth is I just, I lose interest because it just seems hokey to me. So my introduction to our guest was about six years ago and I was listening to Mr. Martini on the plane. I was flying back from Austin, or from Austin to L.A. I get on this midnight flight. I pop on the coast to coast. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm leaning up against the window. And Mr. Martini comes on, and I think, oh, good, afterlife. I'm going to go right to sleep. <laughs> I got off the plane this awake at 2 in the morning because it was captivating to wow. me. It, it, it's one of those very rare shows that stuck with me. Um, for some reason, he just spoke to me. What he said made sense to me instinctively. And he's just like this laid-back cat who talks like, like, like like one of my friends, you know, he lives in L.A., he's a filmmaker, he, he, he's so nonchalant about this topic, like we're talking about sports or something. He's just very nonchalant about it, like no big deal. And that that that's so different from what I'm used to. Uh, unlike one of my real close friends, uh, he has something incredible to say. And what he had to say, uh, first of all, what stuck with me was that he started off as a skeptic, which I like, because he approached this like, well, I'm going to investigate this because I don't believe in it. I like that. Secondly, it was that he, it was the first time I've heard someone talk about the afterlife from sort of a scientific standpoint in the sense that he actually had data. What he did was he looked at Michael Newton, and uh, Michael Newton's a guy who studied uh, over 7,000 cases over 30 some years of research investigating past life regression. So uh, Richard looked at that data. So now we have data. I don't know if you want to call it science. I know scientists get nervous about that, but. To me, it's some form of evidence. There's actually some data that you can collaborate. You could find commonalities. And that's so much stronger than somebody walking up to me and they see my aura. So I felt that, that was, there's something there. And what this data shows is that we don't just die per se, but rather we move on to a spiritual realm where this soul cluster group that we all reincarnate together and, and, and have lives again. Since he ramped up those studies of this material... I mean, I've been following him now since 2012 when I first heard that. He's to the point now where he can communicate with people who have passed on to the flip side. So we'll find out if that's true. And with that, I'd like to introduce our wonderful guest, Mr. Richard Martini. Hi, Pleasure yeah, to have yeah. you here, brother. What a fantastic... Oh, my God. There's our studio audience behind you. Don't look behind you. No, no. It's Just know that they're there. It's the people on the flip side. That's right. That's right. They're giving us applause, man. No, what a wonderful introduction, and I'm so honored to meet you guys. I mean, you know, this is really cool to be here and to be with a couple of friends. You know, and just sitting here talking, like you said, just we're talking about the afterlife. What's the big deal? You know, right. either stuff is or it isn't. I mean, I have a close friend in London who's he's adamant that, you know, this is all coincidence, what I'm talking about. There's nothing I can really do with him. And I actually have organized some sessions for him, you know, with a medium who's really good. And uh, she told him all kinds of stuff that, you know, I found out to be accurate. But even so, after that, he was like, I'm not buying it. <laughs> you know, and it's like I'm wearing a pyramid hat whenever I see him. And I just realized at some point, not everybody's supposed to hear how the play ends. Not right. everybody's supposed to know. 
And and it's not to me to run around the theater, turn the lights on, and go, hey, it's and a, ruin it. It's a play, <laughs> and everybody lives in the end. You know, it's like get off stage. But I realized also, it's like he had told me the story when he was uh, when when you know, uh, it was uh, Sony when Sony was purchased. He was in there with the head of the studio, and he, the head of the studio said, "How many movies do we make that fail?" And uh, my friend said, "Well, about fifty percent." And the head of the studio said, "Well, let's just not make the ones that fail." <laughs> so, if only it were that easy, right? But I, it it applies to this research, which is let's focus on the stuff we can prove. There's a lot of stuff we can, and like you mentioned, Michael Newton. I, you know, when I when I read that he had had so many thousands of clients over 30 years, you know, your brain goes, "Is that possible?" <laughs> yeah. But I also found that Dr. Helen Wamba, a psychologist from New Jersey had done the same research 10 years prior to him. Wow. And she's wrote a couple of books about it, and I've examined all of her cases. And so, you know, the premise is this. If somebody under deep hypnosis says, well, this is the journey, you know, this is what I saw, this is what's happening, um, okay. Then you take the second guy, and if he says something completely different, you know, you go to Schenectady. It's completely, <laughs> well, then you, then you have to go, okay, they're making it up. But if they say the same things, then you can start to get a data set. And so you got Helen Wamba, 2,000 people under hypnosis, where they're saying, I chose my parents. I'm, I'm sorry I did, but I chose them. I chose my lifetime. I, you know, normally I incarnate as a girl, but this time I incarnated as a boy. Those kinds of things that you find consistently in Newton's work. Okay, that was my... As you say, my so now own. you have nine thousand because you got two thousand yeah, from her, right. seven thousand from her. It's <laughs> even right. more crap. Well, I've filmed forty-five sessions, hmm. so I'm there in the room listening to people, and I've chosen the subjects like someone like you guys, mm -hmm. friends of mine who are skeptics, and I say, come, you know, let's just go see. If you don't think you're going to go anywhere, what's the big deal? So mm -hmm. we go what in. What do you have to lose? What do you got to lose? Yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> my favorite one was this uh, film producer who. You know, I'll remain nameless because she said, don't tell anybody my name. But, you know, there you go. We're, we're at this session. She's like, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to see anything. And in 15 minutes, you know, she, in 1820, she's like a cowboy, which I was able to look up while she's talking because I'm, I'm filming. Mm -hmm. The hypnotherapist, Scott DeTamble, I work with him out of Claremont. He's doing the questions, and I'm there Googling the name of the town that she's saying she lives in in 1820. Anyway, the funny part of the story is when she gets to the end of this lifetime, this old cowboy marries a young filly, marries a young girl, and they're out in the desert, and the girl says, would you get me some water? I'm really thirsty. So the guy gets out of the buckboard, and he's like an old dude, and he goes over to the watering hole, and she rides off. And leaves him there to die. So this film producer, <laughs> this woman, is seeing herself as this old man crawling through the desert, you know, trying to find water, and then dies. And then Scott DeTamble asks, so now what happens? And she says, I, not the weirdest thing. I'm like, I'm like this young spirit that I'm climbing out of his body, and, and I'm dancing. I'm jumping up and down. And he says, what's that emotion about? Because it was unusual, right. you know, no solemnity. And she goes, I always wanted to be a cranky old man, and I finally <laughs> did it. Wow. <laughs> Which was like, what? Huh. That's what you, you became. Oh, well, yeah, right. That's, that's me now. Right. <laughs> there you go. So anyway, the point is, is that once you start going into this rabbit hole and people start, friends of yours, start saying the same things about the afterlife. So then I expanded it because I took these, this research over to the University of Virginia. Coincidence. And I just happened to be there, and they said, look – pass it along to us. These are guys who study consciousness, the mm -hmm. Department of Perceptual Studies over there. Dr. Bruce Grayson, Ed Kelly, uh, Dr. Jim Tucker, these are all top guys in their field. And I presented the evidence that hypnosis, people all over the world were saying the same things about the journey. And they began this meeting by saying, you know, we don't, con science doesn't consider hypnosis a valid tool. Hmm, right. And I went, okay, all right. Well, I understand that because of all the, it's an hour long usually. And you're asking leading questions. Right. Okay. But in, the, in this case, as I pointed out to him, doesn't matter who asks the questions. You get the same results. So if you're getting the same results, that's a data set. Right. And as I pointed out to them, look, I'm not a scientist. I'm a filmmaker. I'm just filming people saying the same things consistently. So it's not up to me 
to prove why mm -hmm. that's the case. It's up to you guys. And then they said, well, you know, uh, all of our governments, all of our studies are, are financed by pharmaceutical companies, right? They want to find out mm -hmm. the latest pill and stuff. So they couldn't imagine how anybody would, you know, big pharma would want to finance right. that deal. And I said, look, let me challenge you. Just take one person, anybody, bring them in here. And if you find a Newton-trained hypnotherapist, and I found the one nearby, if you get different results, then we're done. But if you get the same results, then it's up to you as scientists to find out why that is. Real quick, is now when you say most of these people under hypnosis, the similarities, are they similar or they're very specific? Well, they're specific in, in syntax. Okay. So... For example, like what happens? All right, I'll give you like in a nutshell. Sure. And then, by the way, I've I've done five sessions myself, mm -hmm. right? And like you say, as a skeptic, I thought, oh, this is great. I can prove this is fake, because <laughs> I don't I don't want I don't believe I can be hypnotized. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't believe too. I had a past life that I'm aware of, and I can prove it to be false because I won't go anywhere. Right. And if they they ask me where are you and I don't see anything, I'm going to say I don't nothing. But unfortunately, <laughs> it was like I took the red pill. I saw everything <laughs> that everybody else did. You did said. this on film? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So, but I mean, ultimately, the process, what people claim, is that when you go back home, and that's the term people use, mm -hmm. home, not heaven, you go home, you have a guide. So guide could take the form of anybody. So it doesn't have to be a specific person, but it could. you have at least one. That when you get back home, you have a soul group. Roughly people you normally incarnate with, anywhere from 3 to 25 is what Newton saw. Wow. Uh, and everybody appears to have a council, which is people that are sort of non-incarnating individuals who are just there to help you understand why or if you did the things that you set out to accomplish. And so they mm -hmm. kind of go over your life with you. You know, you've heard the term past life review. Right. Mm -hmm. In this case, you're with a group of peers and elders who are very intelligent who say, you know, and you might go, ah, oh, I was great. You know, <laughs> we know somebody who will be sitting there doing that, right? Right, oh, right. It was the best. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it was fabulous. But what they say hmm. is, huh? Yeah, you really think so? What about the time that you did that to that person? Oh, yeah, I wasn't thinking about that. And in Newton's <laughs> example, the one that comes to mind is there was a guy who had got, given away his millions, you know, to help people. And he thought, yeah, I did pretty good. And they said, no, no, no. Did you ever touch anybody? Did you ever move anybody? And he's like, uh, not that I'm aware of. And they showed him a, a time when there, he was on a bus and a woman was sobbing. She had lost everything. And he sat down next to her and put his arm around her and said, it's going to be okay. Hmm. And that moment, that was what his counsel wanted to show him. You saved her life. More wow. important than all That's the stuff cool. that you did. So, and That's I mentioned cool. before we started, I wanted to just toss this in there. And uh, what the heck? Uh, so, Paul McCartney was on uh, James Corden last night. And you might have caught it. If you haven't caught it, it's, it's really, a great one. It's yeah. really it's classic. Yeah. It's all time. However, in the midst of the show, suddenly Paul tells a flip side story. Me, flip side dude, I'd like sat up. What? Turns out the song Let It Be. He's telling James Corden, he says, I was really low. Uh, financially, things were going really badly for me. And I really was worried. I was very stressed. And I had this dream about my mother, he said, mm -hmm. who had passed away some years earlier. Mary, his mother Mary. And she came to him and made him feel unconditional love. But the way he put it was she made me feel really calm. She made me feel loved. And she said to him, just let it be. Everything's going to be okay. So when he woke up, he went like, what, 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 what was that? What did she say? And then like, oh, yeah, she spoke to me. You know, and not to uh, kill your audience's ears, but, you know, uh, how does it go? You go say, you, <laughs> you have the voice. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, how does it start? Let it be. No. Uh, and uh, When I find myself in right. times of trouble. trouble. Yeah. Mother Mary. Everybody, including right. my kids, Comes were like, to me. I thought that was religious. No, it's his mom. Mother Mary comes to me speaking words of wisdom, <laughs> deep, profound wisdom. Wow. Not just like, oh, okay, everything's going to be okay. No, profound wisdom. The only thing he remember was let it be. That 
profound wisdom is what became that song. Mm -hmm. So now Corden is saying, God, you know, my grandfather, if he was only and here. he got emotional. He got really emotional. He said, my dad, you know, had played me that song. My grandfather played me that song. This is the best music you'll ever hear in your life. And, and James said, if only he were here. And Paul, without skipping a beat, said, he is. Yeah. What's interesting is when I did my first Between Life session, okay, and I got to a place I never thought I would get to, and I'm sitting in front of a council of like eight people that I claim to know. I'm looking at them, and it's like I know these guys, but I'm also feeling like kind of weird humility of like, what, who am I? What, you know, why am I here? Like, how did I, mm -hmm. anyway, and I said, so I'm asking all my goofy questions, right, which I can't believe they're answering, <laughs> Anyway, and we get to the end, and just as we're about to finish, and I hear the hypnotherapist saying, well, you know, this was really wonderful, four hours. And, it, and I said, um, wait, 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 wait. Is there anything you guys can tell me that I can pass along to the world? And at the time, it was like, what, the world? I was filming this, but this was like the first week of filming. You know, I had no idea I would end up talking right. to anybody, right? right? <clears throat> Passed to the world, and they said, just let go. And I saw it as let go. Oh, let go of anger, resentment, fear. Let go of all those things that prevent you from being happy or who you're, who you're supposed to be, let's say. Let it be. So when he said that, I like, you know, jumped out of my chair. And I just think it's important to remind people that our loved ones, our moms, our dads, mm -hmm. our grandparents, they're all with us. They're always with us. Our counselors are always, always. They aren't hanging out here, right? They aren't. Right. They got other. Right. They got other stuff to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> they got stuff to do. But if you think of them or consider them or ask for help, they're there. Mm -hmm. You just have to be open. You don't have to wear a pyramid hat, but you have to be open to however they can respond because. Listen, they have a frequency they radiate at. We have a frequency we radiate at. And the two of us have to sort of meet. My wife had a dream recently where she saw a friend of ours who had passed away. And the friend said, you know, the digital clock 1111? Right. We meet at the decimals. <clears throat> so wow. My wife was like, what? What does that mean? I said, well, 111 is a hallway and the other 11 is their hallway. And in order for us to communicate, we have to lean in, and they have to lean in, too. Whereas, and so in this case, Paul... Excuse me, you said decibels. He really means colon. Oh, did I say decimal? Is that I, right. That I but, but, yeah. but it's... Well, go. it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's decimal. better than colon. We mean it to colon. <laughs> that's right. Uh, semicolon. Hello. In case. But, but that idea that Paul's mom, the only way that she could communicate to him, and she did, was to find a way to put that image of her in his mind during a dream and let him know everything's going to be okay. And we all have dreams about our loved ones. Always. And we always yeah. ignore them, and we always go, that was weird. <laughs> it is incredible. That's an incredible story, and how great. Like, now that I'm, like, up on this stuff, it uh, it's amazing how that jumps out at you, how you see that. And it's mm -hmm. clear as day. It's right up our alley. You know? Well, I mean, what recently I've, I've been seeing a lot of angel numbers. Like and you know it's one 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 two 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 three three three, and it's funny that we're talking about this because I see eleven eleven a lot during this last few months of seeing angel numbers. Well, I I like to point out that that number didn't exist prior to digital clocks. Right, you right. Know, it's not like you were looking at the clock going. Right. Is it one minute after? 10? Right, you know? right, right, right. But but it's a it's an odd way of letting your conscious. It's almost like they're sitting over there going. How can we let people know? No, and this right. is important. It's a poke, yeah. It's a poke, but why? See, why? Why did? Why would they care? Why would they care about what we're doing on stage? You see, mm -hmm. and I think it's because they still care about us, about our journey. They're aware that they can communicate to us. We're the ones who are deaf, mm. and imagining that we can't communicate with them, so they're doing their best to find right. a way to tap you to show you, to inspire you, so that when you do see an 1111, it's, you know, it's not like you have to put on the music or cue, or put on the hat. Right, right. The pyramid hat. I'm here. <laughs> you have the simple hat on all the time. All the now, time. That's, that was just a, that's for but, fun. But I was just going to say, just to finish that yeah. thought, is the thing that you want to do when that happens is open yourself up to what? 
That's all. Just what? What, what, could, is it? what could happen? Right. What's the thing? Okay, so that's a great story that Paul McCartney had this probably exactly happen to him. Isn't it true that you yourself had this happen for, I think, either for the quote for your book or for the intro for your book? You got it from the other side, isn't it? Which book? Which quote, I mean? I thought you had, it, was it Robin Williams or somebody that spoke to you and you... you oh, you, the quote, love, love. For the book, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I t- It's a so, similar thing to the Paul McCartney Yeah, thing. and to follow that through, which is, so now here I present my research to the University of Virginia dudes and they go, well, this is not science. And so I went, all right, well, what is science? Science is near-death events. They've studied those, right? And that's something you can actually peer-reviewed science about what happens with... with NDEs. With NDEs. And so ultimately, I, st- I thought, well, wait a second. If NDEs are true, therefore, then they should be saying the same things about the flip side that people under deep hypnosis are saying. Now, as we know, not everybody does. You know, in their near-death experience, mm-hmm. they see all kinds of stuff, right? But there's a majority that have an experience of going through a tunnel, seeing a light, feeling unconditional love. Mm-hmm. So what I did was I started <clears throat> running into people, coincidence, who had had a near-death event. And then I would say, hey, let's do a hypnosis session and let's see if we can revisit the event. Because mm. memory is holographic. It doesn't delete. It's mm-hmm. always there. So right. you can revisit anything. That ha- so they did, and I published that. That was It's a Wonderful Afterlife. And then a medium called me up out of the blue. Where is the blue? But out of the blue <laughs> and said, oh, my God, you know, your work, uh, blah, blah. And I said, oh, well, listen, mediumship, you know, it's it's all about finding love and predicting the future. I don't mean to sound sarcastic, but it, that, that was my brain thought. And I asked this woman, Jennifer Schaefer. Um, she was just here yesterday. Yeah. Oh, was she? Manhattan yeah. Beach. Yeah. Terrific. Jennifer Schaefer, that guy. <laughs> um, but Jennifer said to me, well, I work with law enforcement on missing person cases. And that, you know, like a light bulb in my head, I had been working on the Amelia Earhart story for 30, you know, years. Mm -hmm. And so I said, how'd you like to work on the most famous missing person case in history? She went, I'm in. So I took my camera, went down, I filmed her. I, you know, back in my mind, I'm thinking, if this is true, if this is accurate, I know stuff about Amelia nobody knows. Also, it was weird. I had already had two other mediums answer 20 questions for me. Right. From Amelia. And now here, this is the third example of it. And Jennifer was spot on. I see that alone. If they match up, that to me is I know they it's don't call data. it science, but geez, that's sure that's data. That, it's, that's it's exactly data. right. And you that's can right. all you can examine it or you can toss it aside and say mm-hmm. it's not possible. But wait a second. In in the course of this interview, she says to me, Amelia's telling me that she was dug up by two soldiers. Now, I know that that was written in Fred Gerner's book in 1963 because I'm on it, right? I know Jennifer doesn't know that, but she's saying, Amelia's telling me that these two guys dug her up, but they only found an arm. This was new information. Hmm. I had never heard that, and I've read everything. When I worked on the two movies that have been made, Mm -hmm. they paid me a lot of money to know everything. (laughs) So I read everything, and I was like, what do you mean they only found an arm? And now I'm driving away from Jennifer's office going, did I really just, what the? And the phone rang, and it was an NTSB investigator from Seattle, a guy named Jim Hayton, who I've worked with, and I know him. He's, you know, top drawer. He's been in Congress testifying on NTSB accidents. He says, Rich, I've just gone through this entire body of uh, research that this other researcher had shown to him. He said, everything that you've told me about Earhart is corroborated in his work Hmm. he said except when they dug her up they only found her arm oh my gosh literally a mile half a mile from jennifer's office and it was almost like a sledgehammer to my head like you didn't believe me did you so and then six months later another odd thing i'm doing some research and i find chicago tribune january 1977 Mm -hmm. the two guys who dug her up are being interviewed and off camera they say, well, you know, the truth is we only found an arm and a partial rib cage. So, you see, that detail came from new information. And this is what I'm pointing on. This is what you're talking about. Absolutely. If the information is new, it doesn't matter what it is. Forget about Amelia's arm. That The most important thing about this story is that Amelia can tell us stuff, mm-hmm. okay? 
you know, it's not important where her bones are, I don't think. I think that this Well, we're going to circle cares. back to this because right. it is important to Okay, all so, right, okay, right. yeah. But, but that being said, my point is if you get new information from your loved one who's no longer on the planet, right. pay attention. You yeah. know, if they tell you, go see the doctor about that thing, you know, or they tell you, don't get in the car today, pay attention. Mm-hmm. There's numerous people who, in fact, there's a movie out right now by a guy named Bill Bennett. I saw it. Somebody spoke to him while he was driving and said, slow down mm. twice. And he sl- green light. He was late for the airport. He slowed down, and a truck went right through the intersection. He spent the past five years, ten years, whatever it is, trying to figure out who's talking to me. Gary Schwartz, Ph.D. He's been on a lot of shows. He writes about this stuff. He's at the University of Virginia. He's a Ph.D. from Harvard and Yale. Mm-hmm. He was driving with his wife on the West Coast Highway in Manhattan. Some voice said, "Put on your seatbelt." And he turned to his wife, said, "Put it on." And bang, they were hit from behind. And they were catapulted out of the car, and they lived only because they had their seatbelts on. Who's doing the talking? That is awesome. So my point is, it's not what I do is I said to Bill Bennett, the filmmaker, Australian filmmaker. He's a he's a film dude. I said, you know, dude, if you didn't talk to me, I could have had you go see a hypnotherapist. You would have known who that was in ten minutes. But you know, he spent the past ten years making this movie. But my point is. Uh, you know, it sounds weird for me to say it, but I I really believe that there's many things that we think are not knowable, but that are if we just ask. See, that is just yeah. so profound. Okay, so let, let me get yeah. to my next question here, which is sure. it ties. You said a couple things during during that. Um, 38 minute rant. Um, <laughs> I never got to Robin Williams, by the way. <laughs> oh, go ahead, do that. Well, let me just finish that. So, Please. so Jennifer Schaefer uh, and I, we worked on this book together, and I started having lunch with her and filming her. And at some point, we talked to a number of people who appear in the book. And I, as a joke, I said to her, Can we get book quotes from our the people who appear in the book? She said, What do you mean? I said, You know, Robin Williams appears, Prince appears. Can we get a book quote? And so she sends me a file from wherever she was on vacation. It's her talking to people who say, here's my quote for the book. Robin Williams' quote was, love, love. The idea that love what love is, love that you can give it, Love would it you know all that stuff? It sounds like, but it's just like the Paul McCartney thing though that you you actually got a direct quote from the from the flip side. Yeah. Okay. So during during that, you also said uh, out of the blue, you said um, coincidence. This brings me to my next thing because this is this the other thing that resonated with me back in 2012. Of all the topics we talk about on the show and the paranormal and aliens, all these things, the one thing that I do subscribe to that. I'm so skeptical on most everything, but this one resonates with me because it really does happen. It's what we tend to call synchronicity, where you're having a conversation with somebody and they say the most bizarre thing you've never heard before. Somebody will say, oh, uh, yeah, there's this guy that was abducted by an alien and, and, and they let him drive the UFO. Well, God, I've never even heard somebody say that. And I walk away from that conversation and I go over and I bump into a guy. Uh, oh, can I help you? Yeah, uh, I'm here to speak about I'm the guy that was driving the UFO. <laughs> it's like I've never heard such a thing in my life. And it's like it feels beyond chance to me. So I, I think people call that synchronicity. I've got thousands of examples in my lifetime. I want to know. I, I've, I've heard you say before where well, you went over to London once and you shook a guy's hand. And as you shook his hand, you thought to yourself, this is why I'm here. I've had that experience. We've done that recently. We've talked about these things. What do you attribute that to? Could that be the spirit guide? Yes. <laughs> yes, and um, what I've learned in this research is that once you're outside of time, time kind of exists in a different way. I don't think that it doesn't exist. A lot of people say that in this kind of you know pyramid head research. You know, time doesn't. I love exist. that he that he mocks it like that. That's great. <laughs> well, because, I mean, you but you're know, not not my, you're you're making light of it. I well, like that. Know, I, I like that. No, but I mean, it's not in my research. If it was, I'd be happy to report it. But what I'm getting from people over there in this research, and by the way, Jennifer and I just finished our book. It's called Backstage Pass to the Flip Side, where we talk to these people and I interview them and I ask them questions like, you know, well, who was who greeted you on the flip side? Yeah, when you got there, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea is, once we're outside of time, then, and I had one person in a session claim that she came here and would live to like a 25-year life, 
And when that life was done, she went back to what she had been doing prior to coming here. And she said, it feels like I went out for a smoke. Hmm. That 25 years on Earth felt like 10 minutes over here. And that's been a consistent report. So like I was talking to somebody on the flip side who showed up with me and Jennifer. And I said to him, him, Jennifer's talking, but I said, so wait a minute. Two months ago you were here and you answered this question. I, what does it feel like for you to now talk to us two months later? And he said, like a, a continuous thought. And when I and the I had the experience where when I did my first between life session was in Chicago with a guy named Jimmy Quast out of Easton Hypnosis. And Jimmy, you know, walked me through this process and I found myself visiting a classroom in the afterlife. You know, I'm sure you know I've talked about that. But here I was seeing my close friend Luana who had died and there she That's was. That's what started you on this yeah, whole journey. It started right? on the whole journey. But the idea is there I am with Luana, and I'm having the experience of looking around at this classroom and everybody in the classroom not welcoming me. You know, not like, hey, look who's here, which you would think, right? <laughs> right. Look at all the places you've like, oh, look. No, in this case, everybody's looking at me like, you're interrupting our class. <laughs> Imagine like somebody appearing right here, you know, and, yeah. and they start giving a lecture. Now, over here is Rich Martini, and, you know, here's Captain Ron. And they're, uh, <laughs> so, but the idea of having that guy appear would be annoying. We would be like, excuse us. Sure. We're on the air. So that's what the experience was for me, okay? She's there in the back of the class. I see her, and she's looking at me like, what are you doing? Like, why are you here? And I just kept talking because I thought, <laughs> I've come this far. I might as well speak. <laughs> so, But two years later, I did another session with Scott Tatambal out here in Los <laughs> Angeles. And at the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, maybe the second time I do a deep, I'll have another. But no, it was as if I had left the gate open. He started counting me down. You know, he got to like 98. And I said, Scott, I'm already there. Wow. I'm back in the classroom with Luana, but it's 20 minutes later. <laughs> and I was now with my friend, and she's standing next to me. I mean, this is all new information to me. I, I could never imagine this. She's standing next to me, and she's introducing me to this teacher who I'd seen two years ago, who was looking at me like, excuse me? <laughs> and now I'm standing and looking at him. He's like super tall. And... She's saying, he's just apologizing. This is my friend Richard. You know, he's back home. He's doing some kind of weird project. And, you know, he, he doesn't, he didn't mean to interrupt the class, but he, he yet does have some questions for you. And I'm thinking, it was like, you know, the, the actor's nightmare where they're suddenly on right, stage and right. they're doing Shakespeare. And I'm right. like, hamana, hamana. So <laughs> I, I say, I, you know, I had the presence of mind to go, yes, my questions are, you know, and then I asked him about his class and what's the healing light of the universe and how does this work and bar, 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 which is all in, you know, uh, it's a wonderful afterlife. My point is that two years felt like 20 minutes had gone by. Right. So I, I, so that's a long way of saying when you're outside of time, it could very well be that somebody over there is doing this to you like literally moving this over to here in that time in that time and right. for you it took like six months to get there and, and it feels like coincidence but literally they pushed that guy in front of you so that you could and also also because we asked the question like why'd you do that why'd you make that coincidence happen and and the answer is always almost always to wake you up to make you see. Oh, so you so, so you are saying that that is intentional, that these that, that they are guiding us and yeah. they are putting that in front of us intentionally Yes. to do this. Yes, and it may be not your guide. This is the other weird part of this construct, which is that people claim that we only bring about a third of our consciousness to a lifetime. So right. I like to say we're semi-conscious while we're right. here. But two-thirds <laughs> of that conscious energy, according to what these reports, is always back home. So... The person shoving the person in front of you may actually be you. Be All right. Yeah, interesting. Going, this is a good guest because those right. things happen to me in 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 such a profound way, and I don't really know what to attribute it to. Yeah. But it. I mean, this. We've had examples together where just the most bizarre things happen that are so far outside of chance and probability. Yeah. That what are the odds? Yeah. And, and you do well, think yeah. that that's that someone is watching over someone is is interacting someone is purposely yeah i think it's important me. to add that though which is what are the odds 
Because, you know, I do it in this, this new book that I just finished. And I, every chapter, there's like, a, what are the odds? Same kinds of stories. And, you know, I'll, because, look, not everybody can understand it as we're talking about it. To them, it feels like, wow, what a coincidence. You know, that's, you know, that. it's But it happens too often to be just a coincidence. I used to say just a coincidence, but it happens so often. And then I feel like. I now honestly I, I pay attention to it. Yeah. I'll just give you a quick ten second nugget is that Go like, ahead. even 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 way back, even way back, I, I was like sixteen years old and I had this car and my, my father said, You gotta put tires on that fucking car because we lived in Cleveland and the tires were bald. Where in Cleveland? East side Menor. Okay. And uh you know, it was like winter, and he's like, you got to buy cars. And at, at 16, I really cared about my car, and I cared about my tires, and I was looking at all these different tires. I was looking at Firestones, and good, and I just couldn't decide. This was a big decision for me at 16. Yeah. And uh, one morning, I woke up at like 5 o'clock in the morning. There's this really loud, annoying hum. I'm like, what in the hell is that noise? And I go outside to see what the heck is going on, and the Goodyear blimp was right above my house. <laughs> and I thought to myself... Well, that was the one, and that was the answer. And I bought those tires, and I was so thrilled with those tires. And that's like a mini little example of things that happen all well, the time. Well, okay, and I agree with you. And the reason I asked about Cleveland is because my uncle was in Brexville. so oh, I'm yeah. very. And I put up the when I was in high school, I put up the roof on the high school in the town named something Falls. Oh, Chagrin Falls. Chagrin, thank you. What a great name. Chagrin. Yeah, it's yeah, great. Chagrin Falls, <laughs> but. There, but here's but here, this is an, and it's an interesting topic, I think, and it's something to sort of try to pin down. So if we're going to allow that the answer to your question to the universe was to put the blimp in front of you, how'd they do that? So you'd have to go backwards. Well, I mean, that one could be a coincidence. Well, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> let's pretend that they did. Let's pretend that it is. How would they how would they affect that change? Wind. <laughs> exactly. Or, well, you gotta go back to the crew. You got to go back to the guy who's flying the plane, you know, flying the blimp. Uh, turn left. You know, whatever it is, it, it's a huge, elaborate mathematical puzzle. So I'll give you an example. Um, I was doing a book talk in Arizona, and this woman came up and told me her son had, you know, she had he'd killed himself, and and you know, she was trying to figure out how to access and talk to him and stuff. And she said he's never visited me. And I said, well, have you ever had any dreams? Because dreams are usually a way that they can communicate. She said, well, yeah, I did have one dream right after he passed. I said, what was it? She said, we were in a, it was weird, we were in a, a hotel in Paris, and he was a little baby, and, I, and I, he was on the balcony, and I went back in the room, and then I came out, and he was in the, oh, no, she went out in the balcony, and then she came back in the room, he was an adult. And mm. he was rocking and playing guitar, and he seemed really happy. And now I think to myself, if you're creating that dream for somebody, what's the message, right? Sure. Or your subconscious is creating. You have to allow that. And she said he was playing some music, his favorite song. I don't know what it was. I said, well, you probably do because it's there. You just have to access it. And she went, oh, it was Stairway to Heaven. Uh, uh. And I said, I can't think of a more appropriate song for your son to play for you. And, she, you know, she kind of looked at me like, maybe, okay. And then I got in my car. No, we got we went off to dinner. And then when we arrived at the place where we were going to eat, she said, "You're not going to believe what song was on my radio." See? That okay. So now That's crazy. that happens all the time. So now, to me. but here's the thing. And I said to this to her, and I and honestly, I was going to include it in one of my books. She said, "Don't," because it feels like that's not accurate. And I said, "Okay, it's okay. Whatever." But you have to think like how do you orchestrate that? Because look, the playlist it was made a day before. You know that it's right. a computer thing. Right. So the mathematics involved sure. with, you know, work. However, in this work that I do with Jennifer, people consistently say, yeah, it's math. You know, that's what we did. Like, get over it. That they did intentionally yeah, they, do that. That they did, yeah. That they did the math two days before knowing that this yeah. was going to come up. Because two days before isn't that big of a deal to them, you see. Right. That's that time thing That again. time thing. So if I want to uh, orchestrate the playlist... So that you'll hear the song that I love to make you think of me. That's not so hard for them. So you are confirming then that in from all your research of this, that in fact you should pay attention to these coincidences or these Absolutely. things if they happen, that they could be pointing you in a certain direction Absolutely. or another. And deja vu the same way. People ask me all the time, what's deja vu? We've all experienced it. Like, yeah. oh, I've been like, here before. Well, that's right. weird. Um, and I had somebody on the flip side because I asked them these questions, you see. So you believe it and you go directly to them and you get your well, answer. Well, I want to know the answer. I don't. 
And yet I do have these things happen in my life, and it does feel like, gee, I can't decide which one of these to get. I, yeah, it's pointing me that way. That's yeah, the one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I remember Pete Smith telling me that he was in a bookstore, Pete Smith, the head of the Newton Institute, and, uh, and he, was bus- he was buying a book for some friend of his, and he said, take, you know, whoever it is out there, my guide, you know, take me to the book I need to see. And it took him to a Michael Newton book. Hmm. And that's, and so, you know, he was like, I wish I had been more speci- specific. But that's, you know, the thing is, is we kind of ignore this stuff because it frightens us. Right. And it's disturbing. And it feels like you can control it to some degree. You can. Well, wouldn't that be great? Lottery right. numbers, lottery numbers. Hello. Well, well again, now listen, can I as, as Richard Martini once told me that you cannot <laughs> do the future because we still have free will. Well, that's what I want to ask you this then about predestined, because I've heard this many times. Well, I picked my parents. I picked how I died. I picked, but then we also have free will. How do those two coexist? Lottery numbers. (laughs) Right. Um, Well, I you know I can only tell you based on the research, which is what people say, is that think of it like going on stage. Right. So if you just start with this premise that. The three of us are backstage right See, now. That's a mini one. I was just going to ask right. this exact so, question. You named your book Backstage Pass. I said, how perfect, because he says this whole thing is just like to them, they're backstage, right? and, and, and this life that's is right. being on stage. We're given, and so imagine that the three of us are guys who've normally incarnated together, right? Right. right. And we're, we just came from the most weird lifetimes, the three of us. It was like, yeah, so how was China? You know, and you're like, oh, you know, whatever. And, you know, you were in Australia, and I was like, you know, hanging out, <laughs> hanging out at a party on a rock <laughs> stage. But now we're back, right? And we're all sitting around, and we're talking about what are we going to do next. And, and you may say, oh, I, I, you know, I really want to get that, that velvet rope thing. I want to, you know, I want to be a superstar. Right. And we laugh and go, come on, man. You know, who are you going to help with that? Who are you going to save? And you have friends and loved ones. Right. You have people, and they all kind of pitch in and say, well, you know, I need your help playing this role. But let's say we find, we find, figure out what it is, right? And now one third of us, right, goes off on stage and they have their three by five cards. Right. We're all going to right. meet up somewhere. Right. Well, we'll meet in L.A. like in 2080. Right. (laughs) I don't know how we're going to get there, but, you know, we're all going to have a passion. And when we see each other, we're going to go, oh, God, I know you guys. Oh, that's right. I know you. Like quantum entanglement. Right. 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 When two, when two, uh, you know, it's the same thing. You've got these things, these entities together, energies at the same time, and they move and they find each other. So but you can you have free will. Over there, and as a human, you have free will. You can screw it up. You can say, you know, I'm going to overcome addiction in my 20s, and then I'm going to be, whatever, I'm going to be a musician, and I'm going to recover. But you get into your 20s, and suddenly that addiction thing is much harder. The car, the vehicle that you've chosen has got predilections that it's much harder than you've you've remembered. So you have an outline that you don't necessarily follow to the T. I see. And so nobody beat you up when you get back home, except I call this Wednesday people. And that is people who who agreed to suffer, to go through the stuff, not suffer. That's the right. wrong word. But they agreed to go through the difficulties because we were all going to get together in the third act and we were going to go to Italy together. And out of the blue, on a Wednesday, the tickets to Rome were going to come to all three of us and we were going to meet in a restaurant in Rome. It was going to be fantastic. We had all set it out. The third act. But one of us chickened out. Uh. Couldn't wait until Wednesday. You know, and look, suicide's a really tough topic, but if you realize you're never alone, it's a little bit easier to talk about. So when I was talking about this in Virginia Beach, a woman came up to me and said, I'm a Wednesday person. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I had gone to the hardware store with a list of the stuff that I was going to get to kill myself. Mm. And I was in line, and I overheard these young boys behind me talking, and they were from Africa. They were part of the Lost Boys whose parents had been killed. They were oh, orphans. Right. Yeah. And in that moment, like shaking your hand, in that moment she said, that's why you're on the planet. And she now runs an orphanage in Uganda. Wow. wow. See, that's these are these are the crazy. kind of things. Can, can you speak a little bit about this, Richard, how how— 
when you get there, now I don't want to just say all the religions are wrong or whatever, because you can. Because it seems it seems through your research of what you've shown that these things aren't necessarily how we believe them on Earth. How like in in some Eastern religions that you live a higher life and that kind of thing. That that once you get there, it seems to be that it's yeah, it's it's all forgiven. There's no evil. And even though in that past life you were, I was a slave and you beat me, yeah. we get there, all forgiven, we're back on that plane, and we start over. It's just, it was just a play, because this is just a play. Yeah, except, and yes, and that is kind of what the research shows. But I would also point out, because we've, you've just, you mentioned this, and it's true, we have our own personas. So you can imagine if you had really screwed with me in a lifetime that when we get back there, yeah. I would be there going, you didn't wait till Wednesday. Right? You <laughs> promised, right. you see, and you. So, but but be, that's way different than saying that there's evil there yeah, or no, we would that fight gonna, or anything. You're going to go through a spanking machine, right? And then you're going to be hoisted <laughs> on. You say everything's time. forgiven. Like it's all brand new. Well, and now listen, I, I don't mean to make light of anybody's religious experience because, sure. but all you have to do is a form of logic to work this out. If hell existed, you'd have more than one person who would tell you what it looked like. Right. If it, it was a place, right? People will say, sometimes in a near-death experience, I had this terrible experience. Sometimes, whatever. Usually in a church. Right, you don't hear near-death experiences like that. Some, you do. No, you no. Do. do you hear I, hell? A few. Uh, yeah, no, there's I'll give few. you one example. Dr. Rajiv Party is a friend of mine. And in the initial phase of his near-death event, he had gone to a place that he felt was like really dark and, and scary. And he said... And we were having this discussion. He said, you know, people were there. They were evil and they were they had horns on their head. And I said, hey, oh, yeah. hang on a second. How is a horn evil? And he was like, what? I said, it's matted hair and it's <laughs> cartilage. All right. So, I mean, I understand it's weird looking. But, you know, why is that inherently the evil? evil yeah. And I and, you know, and I've done this with people who recall evil things in their lives. I'll, I, one example was a medium that I interviewed who, when she was a little girl, she said she saw this like gargoyle appear, like a gremlin in her living room. It scared the hell out of her. And just as a matter of course, I started asking her questions about that. And she said, well, he was evil. And I said, why? He's, you know, he's cowering in the corner. He's afraid of you. Well, he had red eyes. And I said, well, what's evil about red? Is he red evil? I mean, and then I said, look, can I ask him questions, this gremlin? And she said, I think so. And I said, okay, so dude, what are you doing here? He said, okay, through her, I'm from another realm. I normally live in, I said, can you, can you talk to us about your realm? Or do you have a family? Or do you have other evil gremlins? <laughs> you hang? And he described this place. He said it was from a denser realm than this one. That he enjoyed being able to come over to this place to hang out and check it out, always by himself. And it was disconcerting to him that this little girl saw him. So you see, suddenly... He's well, this is a good point, too, uh, Richard, that, that, that we haven't really touched on, that, that, that this reincarnation doesn't necessarily mean Earth, right? We have some off-planet experiences. Yeah, well, that's what the research shows. In my own case, I've, I, I, I don't remember anything like that. But However, I've talked to people... As uh, there was a guy that was in the book Flipside who said it's in the chapter under the rain over the rainbow, and he said that he normally incarnated on another planet. And I thought, wow, you know, I never heard of such a thing. So I had lunch with him uh, after listening to his very unusual, uh, you know, session, just to see, like, you yeah. know, what, and also to find out, like, you know, was he a fan of Star Trek and. Yeah. You know, had he read a lot of books? But no, none of that. And uh, he was a gardener in Pasadena. And it was, to him, very disconcerting, the whole, the whole thing. But what this person said while he was under deep hypnosis is that he was part of a group of people, according to him, who normally incarnate in his place, and he identified it as being somewhere. Yeah, I, it's in the book, whatever he said. He mm -hmm. gave a... A designation that which I looked up and found, you know, in the <laughs> right, star right. chart. I like what? But he said that you know, very higher intelligence group of people, and he's got some friends here, and they've all come at the same time to alter the consciousness of the planet. And you know, that's a weird <sighs> question, a weird thing to state. However, 
Then the next question is, how are you doing that? You know, what's that entail? And I've heard various answers whenever I come across that sentence where somebody says, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm here to alter. And they'll talk about uh, the, the grid that hmm. the earth is on or has. And by altering the grid, I guess, I don't know, somehow that alters our ability. And I was going to ask you this. Our ability to experience 1111, coincidence. So hmm. ha have you had more coincidence since you started doing this work? Oh, yeah. Yeah, probably. I mean, I've, I've been but I've been having it. That was 16 yeah. when that happened. Yeah, I, I, oh. I was, since I was a kid, I, I used to see, like, I saw an old, like, a spirit old man in my home, you know, UFOs. My gra I was telling him my grandfather. So I've never seen any of that. See, my grandfather had a near-death experience before I was even born. Uh -huh. And talked about the light, seeing his mother in an open field, you know, the bright light. Oh. And then, you know, coming back, living another 15 years. And I remember when he got sick the last time, he yeah. had cancer, lung cancer. He, he was very like, hey, be a good kid. I, I won't be coming home. Like he knew, he just said, I'm not going to be coming. No, no fear. Yeah. Nothing. And I was just like looking like, oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't come out of the hospital, but he was very okay with everything and so yeah it's 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 amazing to see those events that change our lives and these coincidences the gut feeling all well, that stuff normally you would never talk about that again you know right, right? but right. now here we are yes the time has changed and you know my point is that you can access that ghost because like i say memory i've found mm -hmm. i was gonna say discovered <laughs> but i found in the research that memory is holographic it, really? it retains, you take a hologram of a, a photograph, right. right? And if you smash the hologram, every piece of the hologram retains all the information. Right. Right? So even a sliver has all the details from that event. Mm -hmm. It's like a slice of time. So, I mean, I had an experience once before I began this research where I, I kind of slipped out of consciousness and I felt myself floating around mm -hmm. the universe. It was very intense. And I had the, the thought that wherever there was a photograph of me, I could access it like a portal hmm. because it's a slice of time. Because photographs are right, right. Time. time. It's been you know, put on a piece of paper. But that I could, and I was zipping around in my mind's eye to like my aunt's you know, wallet, to like their attic, you know, different right. places where photographs are. And since then, you know, once I started this research, I asked people, like, is that accurate? You know, is that right? And I do hear variations of that time and, you know, and what we experience is holographic. So a memory that you have, and anybody has, of a ghost or a dream, mm -hmm. like a profound dream or something or a sound or anything, you can ask questions about it without being under hypnosis. You can just say, like, well, you know, who is this? And what, and like, you know, we talked about Dr. Drew, we'll be talking to Dr. Drew. I found that you can take that event and turn that into a portal, a gateway. So once we get into the realm of talking about time, okay, then a, a dream, a memory, whatever it is. In Drew's case, he had a nightmare when he was a kid, he saw something. And it was a recurring nightmare. And I just said, okay, describe the nightmare. Oh, it was really frightening. What was frightening about it? Well, you know, there are these colors. <laughs> Again, what is frightening about the color? And we accessed that memory in such a way that I then said, is there anybody around who can guide us out of this memory and into somewhere else? Your guides are always with you. So just hmm. asking your guide to show up and, you know, Take us on this journey together. Well, this is what I want to ask you right now. Is that, sure. that Why don't you tell, tell our audience a little bit how – I think you've said that the research shows that if you're open to this, that anyone can, in fact, do this. And, in fact, you said, I think if you – one of the ways to know you should use a picture because that could get it in your yeah, mind's eye because right. you're looking at a picture of somebody. Why, why don't you speak to that a little bit and sure. a little bit about how – one of the ways to know that it's working is that when you decide to ask somebody a question – you're given the answer before you ask it. Yeah, very good. And I got this technique through Jennifer Schaefer when we were sitting in Manhattan Beach having our usual weekly conversation. And it'll be in the book Backstage Pass because there's a workbook at the end. But the idea was, how do you do that? 
Like, what's the simplest way? And so it came to me from none other than Michael Newton, hmm. which is unusual because I didn't know Michael Newton. I mean, I, I interviewed him, right? You're the last on-camera interview with him. Right, but I, and I'm a fan of his work, and I interviewed his wife, and we shared a couple of emails. But he was a very specific kind of guy. You know, he was like a you know very um, tough scientist kind of a guy, and so he didn't really suffer fools lightly. He wasn't a guy you could just, you know, dial him up and like, what's right. going on? I, my experience with him. And by the way, I've shared some of the stuff that he said to me with close associates of his. Hmm. So I'm sitting with Jennifer, and she goes, this is how it came down. She said, uh, Morton is here. And I looked at her like, who's Morton? She said, you know, Morton, that guy, the guy you wrote the book about. I go, now, hey. is she like doing a session during this, or are you guys just sitting around? We sit around, we have coffee. And, and she gets visited and, and feeling gets, like, she, yeah, that's because she's works. a medium, because she That's uh, right. And, okay. and I, you know, and she'll argue that anybody can do this, but it, because she's been, she's had over 3,000 cases and <laughs> sessions, you know, she's adept at it. Like what she sees as an image off in the distance, she'll then translate it. Here's what I'm seeing, she'll say. I'm seeing this. In this case, she says, I'm seeing Michael Newton, that guy. But she calls him Morton, which is kind of funny because, <laughs> you know. Those two names mushed together. Yeah. And yeah. if she was trying to convince me that he was there, that wouldn't be the way to do it. Right. <laughs> but so she goes, Morton's here. And I go, oh, you mean Michael Newton? Yeah, that guy. Uh, what does he want? I'm like a little concerned. You know, does he want to give me a critique? <laughs> you know, <laughs> From the flip side. Right. Stop talking right. about my work. Right, exactly. Your, mo <laughs> your movie sucks. Um, but no, he said, I said, so what are you doing, Michael? He said, I'm taking notes. I said, really? You're taking notes on what? He said, I'm taking notes on how to communicate between the two sides. Hmm. I said, let me get this. I'd like to repeat myself so I can clarify it. I say, well, let me get this straight. You're taking notes so that we can help communicate with you? And he said, no, the other way around. So this guy spent the last 35 years of his life on here trying to contact the other side. Then he got there, and now he's trying to contact us. He's trying us to help here. them contact, contact, contact us. Wow. He said it's a form of noetic science. Now, I had read Dan Brown's book, and so I know the term, but mm -hmm. I didn't know what it meant. And Jennifer didn't know what it meant either, but I, he said it. So I had to look it up, and it's the you know study of helping people with ESP. He said, I'm hmm. over here helping wow. people communicate with their loved ones over there. And I said, okay, great. So give me a one, two, three. What's the simplest way? And, and by the way, I was about to go on, you know, George Nuri's show. And I said, you know, do you want me to say anything on your behalf? And he said, well, here's the one, two, three. He said, just say their name. If you want to talk to somebody, say their name. And I said, do you say it aloud or Thank I'm you. trying to be yeah. specific, you know? Or in your head, he said, it doesn't matter, Richard. Okay. All right. So, but wait a second. How do people differentiate between asking questions that, and he said, you know, just, and then ask your questions. And I said, how do you differentiate between imagination and, you know, talking to your loved one? He said, when they answer the question before you can form it. Isn't that insane? That's a good one. That shows you're connected. Yeah. So and so I've you know expanded it in my own martini way, right? He's keep it simple. I tried to use the med word meditation. I said, you know, should people meditate on a photograph? And what I mean by that is, when you take out a photograph of a loved one, you have emotions, especially if they just passed away. And so what I say is, you know, set aside the emotions. Just look at the photograph. Try to recreate in your mind how it was taken, where you were what the sound was like, who, you know, was there laughter, what was going on. That helps you to mm -hmm. focus on their frequency. That's the point. But he said, don't use the word meditation because it makes people think they have to do yoga. Right. And then they have to exercise. It always turned me off. So you lose people. <laughs> yeah. That was his point. Yeah. Of, hey, well, that, agree that's true because that's a word that makes me go, okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah. yoga. You know, it'd be a pyramid head. And so, <laughs> but he's saying, don't even say the word. So, okay, uh, photograph's fine. But you don't need to say it. You don't need to do it. Just say their name aloud. I say say it aloud. Say it three times. Why not? You're, let them hear you. Now, listen, if they're busy, right, people on the flip side are not just sitting there waiting for you to call. <laughs> they, could be, they could be in a classroom. They could be doing something. 
But they will get to you, and you ask the questions, and the questions when you suddenly you say, so what? And now I suggest, adding to Michael's thing, ask questions you don't know the answer to. Because if you ask a question, you know, are sure. you okay? Mm-hmm. You know right. the answer. Yeah. Right. I've heard, right. I've heard people tell me this. They go, I asked them where they were, and they said, I'm right here. <laughs> and then I asked, are you okay? And the answer was, yeah, of course. How are you? And so, it was like, okay, that's not a conversation. Ask them who was there to greet you when you crossed over. Hmm. Who was the first person you saw over there? And you'll hear it, or you'll feel it, or you'll sense it, or you'll see, like Grandma Betty, or somebody weird. Oh my God, what's funny is my grandma, my dad's, my my grandpa's mom was Betty. Thank you. <laughs> Grandma Betty. Crazy. All right. <laughs> well, we can ask. Like, oh my God. We can funny. ask your grandpa who was the first person he saw. Yeah. We can do that, and you can do that. Yeah. It's up to you. But I mean, that idea, like, who was there to greet you? And then you, I ask questions like, so what's your day like? What you know? Do you sleep? Mm-hmm. I, I ask silly questions. What's a, how do you create something fun? Um, you know, do you carry any of the sadness? Right. Or, See, this is coming up in our difficult questions at the end too you're going to come back we're going to circle back to this why don't you touch on a little bit about how sometimes people have um a a lingering injury for example or or, or they have a fear of water let's say and then it turns out in a previous lifetime they maybe they drowned yeah um why don't you speak a little bit about how people it seems like people don't attribute they don't notice that or attribute it to a past life ever to a phobia exactly all right so and the first time i came across one of those was in when i was doing flip side and this woman that I interviewed, um, I filmed, she is a hypnotherapist out of New York, Sophia Kramer. And Sophia, suddenly, in the midst of this session that I was filming, started drowning. <laughs> and she was remembering a lifetime in 1880s where she was on a German ship. She was an Irish sailor. There were details that she told me or told the camera that I was able to look up. You know, the town she was from in Ireland, how it was pronounced, unusual things. But ultimately, she remembered being for drowning, and she started saying, they pushed me off the ship, and everyone's on the ship watching me drown. It's like they're enjoying it, and she's swearing like a sailor. And But ultimately, she gets to this point where she's choking and gasping, and then, so what I found out later on was that she had a phobia of swimming, okay? And so she had asked the hypnotherapist to examine it, and so now... That was the question was, you know, have you had any other previous lifetimes that might have something to do with swimming? And boom, she went to right to that. But when she got into the between lives realm or up, he said, let's, you know, rise above the scene and look right. down. Life on between it. lives. Yeah, yeah that's once, a good once way. we got yeah. there, she said, oh, wow, the captain is telling me you have no idea how hard it was to kill you in this lifetime. That, and she said, you know, he's showing me it was an agreement that I had asked him to help me experience the negativity of those actions. Hmm. And then she said, oh, he's my father in this life, and I just saw him saving me from drowning when I was like four years old. Something incredible. she had no access to. Sure. She didn't, wasn't aware of it, but she saw the event. So, but, and then I filmed her like about a month later f- swimming. So she had, and I ran into her in the elevator after the session. She said, I had the most wonderful dream last night where I was just swimming and swimming and swimming. And and normally that would have been a nightmare for me. But because I was able to address that. Now, it's very unusual for somebody to address a phobia that way because if, you know, we go through, let's say we go back to the between lies realm and, you know, we're hunky dory, everything's fine. You know what? What's that phobia doing, hanging around, lingering around? It's interesting that that carries over to the new life. Well, I have a feeling it's either that that it carries over. This is what most religions say or philosophies in this area, like karma that carries on. But the research that I've been doing, that's not what happens. It's that we are between lives and we're doing that thing. We're sitting around talking about like, what are you going to do next life? Hey. That drowning thing, you are scared. Every time you go back, you're scared of drowning. Why don't you do it this life? Why don't you work on that? Maybe you can overcome that. And you're like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. Yes, you do. And That's you, interesting. So, so karma is not, and karma, the word in Sanskrit it just means energy, okay, or action. 
So it's not like people carry that around and they can't let it go and they come back and they're blah, blah. They choose to explore it. They choose addiction. They choose anger. They choose, I want to overcome the fact that I've killed you in so many lifetimes. Well, yeah, listen, while you're right there, I want to, I want to touch on this, Richard, because I thought this was one of the most interesting things that you stumbled across, that there are people, for example, um, who went to Auschwitz or whatever, and they were they were being obviously horribly treated and everything. And yet they chose that life because that's better than being the persecutors. Why don't you address easily, that? Well, easily the most controversial thing I've ever heard. And it, Isn't it crazy And it happened the first day. So hmm. I had asked the Newton Institute if I could start a documentary about Michael Newton. And as I mentioned on flip side, it was because I read in one of his books where this guy was saying he was in a classroom between lies, which is what my friend as she was dying was saying, you know, I keep having these recurring dream in a class. <laughs> and and so when I read his book, I went, ding, okay, that's what I need to focus on. See, that on. was a synchronicity thing that happened to you Absolutely. that started you on this whole journey. Absolutely. Had that synchronicity not happened, you wouldn't have even been no, studying this. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. So, we would have having a very entertaining show right now. <laughs> <laughs> but in this particular instance, uh, so I said I'd like to do a documentary about them, and they were like, no, no, Michael's retired. You know, he's, He doesn't talk to the media anymore. Really? Okay. Well, I live in Chicago. I'll, I'm going to go back. I'll be there. They said, well, you can come and film the workshop. So I went there, and I met Michael, and in a few minutes he went, okay, I'm going to give you my last interview. So hmm. I filmed him for about three hours. I filmed his wife, et cetera, et cetera. So now they said, okay, we're doing a demonstration. Do you want to film that? I was like, yeah, great. So I get to this room. There's about 100 people. Oddly enough, I've become friends with some of the people who were in the room that day. Scott DeTamble, for example. I didn't know him then, but... You know, I'm looking at the footage later. I'm like, oh, there's Scott. I start filming, jaded filmmaker that I am. I'm not sure what I'm about to see, and I'm wondering, are, is this staged for my benefit in some way? You know, they've yeah, this is before me. you're even into the topic. Yeah, at all. not at right? all. This is brand I had new. read Michael's books, but now I'm in a room with people, and you know, as that's a, different. That's different. And yeah. if you're as a filmmaker, you have to be aware. You know, are is are people going to do stuff to? because they're on camera. Right. That's what you right. think, right? And I'm a pretty good judge. You know, I've been doing it a long time of when people are acting, you know, badly, or when they're just being themselves and they don't know the camera's there. I, I'm, you know, I would say that I'm pretty good at that. I could be wrong. But in this case, this woman, who, by the way, happens to be a, a hypnotherapist in Sedona, she, you know, went through her lifetime and I've very normal kind of life stuff. And, and now the hypnotherapist, Paul Orend, uh, who former president of the Newton Institute, he teaches a lot of workshops and stuff. He's conducting the session. Michael's standing behind him and making notes on a chalkboard. And I, and I hear them say, let's go to a previous lifetime has some significance to this life. And she says, I'm in Auschwitz. I'm in a gas chamber. And I'm, then they're about to turn the gas. I'm in the showers, and they're about to turn the gas on. She and she's very stressed and very emotional. Of course, jaded filmmaker thinks, "Oh, really? How convenient!" <laughs> right? You know, I mean, <laughs> right. the yeah. first time I've turned my camera on, and now we're in Nazi land. Right. And right. Now we're going to address Hitler. And I, you know, I was thinking to myself, "Is it possible?" Anyway, so now, <laughs> but thankfully, the way these things work is is Scott uh, Paul Oren says, "Let's go back to something happy in your life." So she goes back through her life. And she gives the name of this woman and where she lived. And I found her. I found this woman in the records of Auschwitz. And ultimately, she talks about her family and how they got rounded up and how they wound up in Auschwitz and how everybody died. And now when she dies and passes on, um, she's crying. You know, and, then, and now she goes back home. To the life between lives. The life between lives. And she's greeted by her loved ones who all died and her guides. And she's happy now, of course, and she, her whole demeanor changes. And she's talking about, oh, it's so great to see my son. And, oh, you know, all these people I'm so, oh, my gosh, this person is so-and-so in my lifetime now. Oh, this is So she's kind of going through all that process. And, by the way, afterwards I interviewed her, and, and she has a, she's a chapter in the book. She had never had this past life memory before, had never had this experience. But now she gets to her guides, her counsel. And she says, I'm asking them, why? Why did I choose such a difficult life? This was so hard. I lost everybody that I loved. And she said, oh, 
this is going to be hard to express, but they're showing me that it was more difficult to choose to play the role of a perpetrator than a victim in this life. Mm. And you then, imagine? And then she said, well, and it's important to hear this, and then she said, every day was a heightened, intense lesson in the camp where you had a lesson in courage, lesson in forgiveness, a lesson in compassion, just tons of these intense lessons over a short amount of time. She said, but from my perspective, I see what the people who chose, she said, they're showing me these images of the people who chose these roles to play that role on stage. Right. Showed that it was more difficult to play that role because it was much harder on them spiritually. Because to recover from that kind of trauma is going to take many, 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 many lifetimes. Well, all I can say is my head shot up from the camera, and I looked around the room like, where am I? That was the most... Yeah, that's the most profound thing I've heard in all yeah. of this material. And, and so I, but, but since then, then I started filming these other people, like the woman who <clears throat> then you know saw that the guy that killed her was somebody she had asked to. So I started to see that throughout all of the... The work and, you know, coming from a, a whatever theatrical background and plays and movies, you know, it's a good and apt metaphor. It's perfect. Is, you know, mm. you when you're in, doing improv, you know, you right. go out and you do improv and you get the three by five card. They tell you you're going to be a doctor and, right. and now you're going to find your wife. Go. And, you know, hopefully it works. But there's more details because there's a whole cast, you know, and, and everybody has. So. When I try to help people not access the stress or pain, let's say, right? One thing about this work is that when you see that we chose our lifetimes or when you come to that realization or you accept that it's a possibility, okay, that changes your past. That changes the sadness of all the terrible things that have happened to you. Because you're looking at it from a different viewpoint. Now, if it's just a movie, it's just and a movie. And now it changes your future. You see? You can change your future, change the now, by accessing the past to see that you may have chosen those particular... Because you've changed your perspective, because yeah. now you're realizing you chose me. I, I'm never going to get any of these merit badges. I'm not strong enough for any of this, man. <laughs> I mean, my life now, to me, would be like as hard as I would Well, the question is, why'd you choose it? I can't figure that out yet. Dude, I would just offer. Uh, yeah. That's why you're here today. Yeah. And I have a I have a question since we're using the analogy of plays. Yeah. Some plays go on Broadway and they last a very short amount of time and then there's some plays that last for years. How many times are we going to the after or the, the middle? And rediscovering that we have to come back. I mean, how many times do we have to come back? Because I've heard many people, oh, this is my last time. Yeah, I'm I've heard done. That too. I've heard that I'm not too. coming back. I don't want to come back. Right. So how would they know? Yeah. So how do how do we know? That's a great question. And the only answer is only you know the no, answer. The to that. <laughs> I mean, but you could, I can say what other people tell you. But what does the data say? Well, the data, that's what we want from you is the well, scientific data. So, or, well, here, well, here's data. what the here's what the data is in terms of my own question of, and it came from my guide. So now this was the second time I did one of these sessions, and I'm talking with Scott to Tamble, and and Scott asked this question. So how did you become a guide? How did you become Rich's guide? And he said, and was was weird. Now, this is yeah. I just for our audience, you're, you're you're talking to somebody that's speaking to your spirit guide or whatever. Correct. In my mind's eye, I'm seeing this older gentleman. Well, older. I mean, you know, he's probably a, he's probably my age. He's like in his late sixties. Um, I you know I can see him in my mind's eye. You know, he has hazel eyes. He's a very friendly dude. Um, and when I had my first, you know. Between life session, when I saw him, I was most people report when they see their guide, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, there's my guide, you know, my mentor, the person I've. In my case, it was like, hey, dude, you know, how you doing? And his reaction <laughs> to me was more along the lines of, you okay? And like, so yeah, he's so you're nonchalant fine. about this. It's just well, like, I mean, eh. well, that was his. That was the reaction. I thought, well, this is weird. You know, I'm not fawning. He's like, you know, you got this. You, you know, you're fine. Don't worry about it. You know, where do you want to go? Is what he was saying to me. So now, when Scott asked this question, so how do you become his guide? I see him sitting where you are, let's say, but in my mind's eye, part of my consciousness, like zip, goes out of my head and into him. And now I'm looking at me. 
over there. And I don't look like me the way mm-hmm. I look now. Mm-hmm. I look like I'm about 22, 23. Uh, the clothes I used to wear when I was in my 20s, uh, my, my body's a little elongated. Right. I have long hair. It was weird. I mean, I'm seeing myself as a young guy. And now I'm talking about Richard, but, you know, Richard's talking. And I'm saying, well, this is, you know, we're the here's the process. You know, and he's trying to say it in the simplest ways for me. He said, look, um, souls come into existence at any time. It's they it has nothing to do with the Big Bang. It's not being outside of time. It's just they come into existence at any time. And if you want to just as an example, take two ions, you could say one female, one male, and you put them together. That's that's the that's how a soul is created. Mm-hmm. And then they're nurtured and taken care of by these kind of watcher guides. You could call them like, you know, in a nursery, right? People who watch over a soul in a nursery. And then eventually you, they people kind of add stuff and energy kind of goes in there. And then I'm living my lifetimes, the guide says. And when I'm graduated, Richard was my graduation gift. Hmm. I think you also said it's like a painting too, and each life you're adding to that painting, right? That's what he said. Yeah, and then the he whole said, "Painting is done." That's right. He and and that was the next thing he said, yep. which was Richard and I then st- st- like stood in front of a canvas and said, "What do you want?" And then it was like, "Well, I want this color and that color, and this is what I want." And then eventually you go and live that thing. Then you come back between lives. You're like, "Oh, you're missing a little red," hmm. you know. And so now go I'm going to go, again. yeah, go back again, keep doing it. So eventually, is that considered the old soul? Well, I would just say, you know, if you've had a hundred of them or a thousand yeah. or whatever, or maybe you're somebody who was like, well, I'm on top of this. <laughs> and you might just go through one. I mean, I yeah. guess it's yeah. possible. But your guides would have to go, dude, you're way ahead of everybody yeah. else. The idea is you graduate. Right. Right. And But here's the graduation. It's not easy because you graduate to watch over somebody else. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, your graduation All is you pretty much lives. stay there in that in-between stage. Yeah. And now you're a guide. To the people that and are, you're watching over every little detail that that person is living, and they may ask you at some point, "Would you come down and play the role of Aunt Betty, Grandma Betty?" You know, because I need your help. And you might go, "Nah, all right, I don't really want to, <laughs> but okay, I'll do I've it." Done for this you. a thousand times. Yeah, well, I'll do right. it. And so you go down there, you play this role. It's no big deal to you what happens because you know you're going right. back home. And okay, and so ultimately at the now, what happens after that? So I've talked to people on councils who used to be guides. Hmm. So they graduate from being guides to being non-incarnating individuals or on councils. And then I just came upon this like a month ago, talking to somebody who was a council member, doing the same thing I do, which is, you know, ask questions. Who are you? What's going on? What's your name? How did, how did you earn your spot on this person's council? You see, so mm-hmm. the average, it's between six and 12 people on a council. Those people on your council earned the spot on the council because of something you accomplished. Hmm. Like the woman who accomplished compassion and courage in Auschwitz. She would have somebody on her council. An empty bench behind me, yeah. Nah, <laughs> well, probably not, dude. But, <laughs> but all I can say is each person on a council, it represents something. And so you can ask them, what do you represent? And it's a weird construct because I'm talking to somebody who doesn't know what I'm talking about, like Drew. Right, right. And then we're now talking to his counsel, and I'm saying, what do you represent? And then Drew is saying, patience. Okay, well, that's an interesting quality. You know, can you show him how he earned that? And he'll see, like, oh, it was that weird lifetime where I was like, anyway. So that's the point is that we are guided by people who, are, you know, have our best interests at mm-hmm. heart. They know us really well. Council members have councils. They have their own councils. And then I just discovered this, which is they serve on other people's councils. Because hmm. I, I started asking the question, so do you serve on any of the councils? How many? You know, one person said three, and then the another one said 12. And I think to myself, wow, you know, that's disconcerting. Like, I'm over here struggling. You're like, Where's- I want the full attention. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> me, me, me. Okay, so I think we've painted a picture. I think people get the idea now. You cross over. You go to that in-between world. You come back over and over with your soul group of 15 people. Then you graduate to become a, a guide, and then you move up. Now you're on these consoles. Right. Or something That's else. sort of. And that's, that's from you, Richard, regular guy, casual guy. 
a filmmaker that's been researching this. Yeah. Are there people that are crazy into this where they get together and maybe there's 10 of them and they all have figured out that we're in part of the same soul group? Are there other people out there studying this that that have gone hardcore about this and figured that out? Um, well, it's a good question. I, I, you know, I don't think I know any, but I do, of course, the hypnotherapists, right, who are doing this kind of work, the people who are trained at the Newton Institute, they've so far have, I think they have currently 200 countries they're in. Wow, they 200. have two or wow. 3,000 uh, members, um, you know, that are that trained with the Newton Institute. I recommend them, you know, listen, a lot of people can do past life regression. Anybody can. Any psychiatrist can. But because the Newton people are familiar with the between lives realm, I'd mm-hmm. like to say, look, if you're going to go to the Himalayas, you want to go with somebody who's Good been Sherpa. there. Right. right. And they exactly. can. Good Sherpa. Somebody who's who can show you like how, you know, don't go down that path. Right. Walk this way. Because a lot of times people just read from a script and the person, you know, says, I see like, you know, this in the background. And the hypnotherapist doesn't take the time to go, well, what's that? So anyway, I, I, yep. that's why I recommend. I also recommend that you get recommendations from people. Mm-hmm. You know, you you talk to them, et cetera, et cetera. You find a way, you know, to find the right person for you and call them and tell them this is what I'm looking to do. Right. You know, again, um, what's the value of this? I think the value is a. You can talk to your loved ones. You can access them. B. You start to realize that if this is a campground that we can return to, doesn't it make sense to leave behind a clean campsite? Mm-hmm. Fresh water. Coming up next. And I, what's funny is I did a, a past life regression once, and I was like, there's no way. There, I mean, right. my, I'm too ADD. I can't do it. And, in fact, I did. I started visualizing, and then I thought, well, they're just – leading me i mean they're just telling me what to so what'd you see uh i saw me in a cottage back in like the uk and i i was probably an older man had a wife you know i could see the garden all this stuff i was an artist i was a painter i could see my paintings in like really like a palace and what's weird is she she did say well what's your name and i came up with a name and i'm like okay name i end up looking it up and i found an artist in England, back just like the fact that he's an artist is, is corroborating evidence. Well, the the thing yeah. is, is once you have a physical item, right, yeah. that you can look at, then you can access it. You see, and yeah. then you can go back. You could say, "Where's that painting? You know, where yeah. where does it exist?" It's weird. Somehow, our frequencies get attached to the things that we care about. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. And and so you can still act like I was saying, photographs or portals. So you're like I was saying also that memory is uh, holographic. So when you remember where those paintings are, and I was I was going to take Jennifer Schaefer yeah. to a museum here and film her to see to see what she gets from a painting. Wow, that would be awesome. Because that like, would be probably cool. get each really artist. Oh my God! Well, well, it's just painting. well if you, you know think about this, you think about this. When you look at a light and then you close your eyes, you still see that yeah. that image. So really, it's like, why not having the images you see from your past or past lives that well, are embedded? But here's, and then what's the physical aspect of it? And so I've gotten this out of the research as well, which is that people claim that we have these fractals or geometric shapes. Mm-hmm. Some people call them uh, form const- constants. Constants, yeah. Um, and they retain all the memories of that lifetime. Kind of like okay. Akashic Records type of thing? Well, a little different. Okay. But these geometric shapes are like portable hard drives oh, okay. that follow you around. So it's like flying around <laughs> with you while you're having your lifetime. Right. And then when you need to access information, you sort of zap. Siri? Yeah, Siri. <laughs> now, what's weird about that is my first Between Life session, I found myself in a classroom describing what these students were doing hmm. and i what i was saying i have no conscious idea what it means but while i was there it was like i totally know what it means and they were repairing those hard drives wow they were saying that these these geometric shapes pick up gunk over lifetimes so what you're accessing is kind of screwy mm-hmm. but they go up and clean them I mean, I was like, what? But I was saying it as if, like, yeah, yeah, this is how it works. It's in the movie Flipside. I actually put some 
ball bearings being cleaned, right? Because <laughs> they use it. They use that as an example. Like right. you think of it as ball bearings. The you know the ball bearings help a machine to get through its daily routine. Right. They're very small, and but they're really necessary. And so apparently these things that follow us around, you know, are things that help us. That's great. We uh, we wanted to ask you. Uh, how has all this changed your life? Has this changed your life now that you know all this? Because you didn't know this before, obviously. Well, I annoy a lot of people. <laughs> but, you know. I chances, heard you did that before, though. Chances that really are I probably annoyed people before. <laughs> no, I mean, it is. it can be really annoying. I, I was, I'm just reflecting on the fact I saw a couple of friends of mine recently, you know, this guy from England and another friend who was like, you know, a scientist kind of a guy. And they were like, Rich, you know, you really are wearing the pyramid hat tonight. And I was, I was kind of. Because they were talking about this thing. We, we live in this pyramid world where I call it conditional love, where, you know, you love me and I love you. And, but what people say between lives, we live in a place of unconditional love, and there's no hierarchy, right? So the more money you have has nothing to do with who you are as a soul. Right. The right. more things you acquire has nothing to do with who you are as a soul. The more knowledge you acquire, again— Nothing. Zero zip. So we were talking about, you know, famous people and what they'd achieved. And then somebody who died, let's say. And then it was like, you know, oh, they just it's so sad they didn't achieve the thing. And, you know, Mike, uh, at some point I got to say, so when is the appropriate time to die? Right. Is there a date? <laughs> right. You know, right. I mean, I mean, look around, you know, when right. do you ever see anybody go, well, thank God. He, I mean, look, with somebody who lives to be 102, people go, well, it's about time, <laughs> you know, but it's right. like, where is it? 92? You know, well, they still go. It's such a loss. We lost. You know, I like I liken it to chrysalises, you know, you know, caterpillars mm -hmm. crawling around and then they turn into that weird chrysalis thing. And then they turn into a butterfly. Right. But we just focus on the chrysalis. And we build monuments to chrysalises. We, like, worship them. We have them hanging up in different churches, mm -hmm. temples. Chrysalises, ah, all hail the chrysalis. But the butterfly is on your shoulder going, <laughs> hey, dude, I'm here. I'm still here. It's <laughs> right. me. Like, ew, get off of me. What the? Get that insect off of me. <laughs> right. But it's like, that's your brother. That's hilarious. <laughs> Love All right, it. Richard. Now I'm going to uh, wrap this up with giving you three questions that, are, that that well, we can go after this, but I got th the three All last right, questions, ahead. and then we're done. We can go off book. <laughs> but I've got these are going to be tough questions. I'm going to go a little judge bit here. Of that. Yeah, well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> it's interesting though how some of these words I noticed we, we we said soulmate and we say spirit guide. Those are like words that are in our normal vernacular, and yet from this perspective, mm -hmm. they kind of have more of a Interesting meaning to them, soul yeah. mate. You know, it's interesting. Okay, so question number one. Upon our death, you say there's no judging. It's over. It's only energy and truly unconditional love, right? Correct. Okay, so we as a group choose our next life. Yes. To come back to serve humanity and try to gain these skills and experience and have more knowledge and wisdom. If all this is true, then why doesn't life on Earth improve? Why doesn't humanity get better? Why... If we're going to come back again, why do we destroy our planet? 45. There's so much more atrocities and, and human abuses going on. Why, why, if we know we're coming back, why does this still happen? You have to look at the Earth. Start. So, you know, the, the idea is this. People say in this research that, you know, I'm, I'm talking to people who are in a classroom in the afterlife. I'm like, what are you working on? And they'll say, well, we're seeding other planets. What do you mean you're seeding? We're changing other planets so that they can take life. Really? So how did the Earth come about? Same process. Again, once you're outside of time, we, you can sort of look at this. So you're saying that they would let this, this planet go to hell, if you will, because they know we're moving to another one anyway. That, no, that's not what I'm saying. They've been protecting this planet because it's a hard, lot of work to get us to come here. Yeah, but we have come back. We have, well, hey, no, we have on, people well, doing terrible things to the Earth on, right now. Hold on, hold on. One thing at a time. <laughs> and so... What I So let's say you're going to start this planet, right? And it's going to occur a million years in the future. And you do your best to make sure everything, the minnows eventually turn to vertebrates, et cetera, et cetera. Dinosaurs eventually rule the earth. Ah, oh, time to send a meteor. we got to adjust that. <laughs> so those die-offs and comebacks, 
those are all about creating the animal that is known as humans. Okay, that's okay. the physical animal that we are. That has a finite amount of time. It used to be about 30 years. Now it's about 90. But, you know, 2,000 years ago, not that long ago, people only lived to average right. 30, 40 years. What can you learn and pass along? You can basically get on stage, dance around, and fall over. That's opening it. Opening act. All right, opening act. Right. And now we're talking about 90 years. Well, what do you – What do you listen – when I send you to an amusement park, when you were 10 or 15, you went in there and you were like, you can't get me out of here. Now, a little bit later, you're like, can I get some popcorn? And and go I, home. Go <laughs> home. So the journey and the adventure that's here is relative to who we are. Again, we're not these people on the planet. We are these souls. I won't call them eternal because we do graduate. We do change and everything changes. But we are these souls that have been around for a long, 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 long time, and we come here to have this adventure, this campground, this playground. Now, people will say, well, look, the campground is getting overfilled. Well, this has happened, don't you remember, like 14 kalpas ago, as they used to call it in, in uh, Hinduism. So they claim in, in Bra the Brahmin you know, version mm -hmm. that the universe expands, and then it collapses, and then it starts over. Right. So we've, you know, in that theory and in this research, people claim that, yeah, there have been other Earths. We've oh, I understand that for the, for, for the So <coughs> your question classic. is, why, isn't it, why, are, why aren't we fixing it? No, my question is, why do these souls who know better and have come here let anything bad happen to Earth? Because the process is, once you come on stage, you forget everything. Hmm. Now, it's an interesting note Side note, but it's interesting. I was coming out of my meeting with uh, Jennifer where Michael Newton had shown up, right? And I'm looking at my cell phone, and the word uh, mnemonic is on it. M-N-E-N, -N, uh, however you spell it. Mnemonic. You know what that means? Hmm. No. You do, do you know who Mnemosyne is? Hmm. You know who I've, that I've is? heard. I've, You've I heard that name? Yeah. Okay. Not very familiar with it. Right. None of us are. She was the most famous goddess oh. during Greek history. Why? Because she was the goddess of memory. Every <laughs> Greek play began with a prayer to Mnemosyne. Why? Because plays lasted two or three days. You were hoping, let me remember all the lines. In her myth, which is 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, she's this goddess of memory. And when you arrive here, you take a drink from the river Leth which hmm. is that river that people cross over to go mm -hmm. home, and you forget all your past lives. Hmm. And so while you're here, you only know this one life that you're here. And when you die, Namazani's there, and she gives you a drink from the river Namazani. A little sippy poo. A little sippy poo of, <laughs> of remember juice. Yeah, right. And you remember all your lifetimes. So well, now Don't you, go you think back. our spirit guides would be pointing us away from... But you know what's, and stuff? what's weird about that is I asked Michael Newton, why did you put that on i mean did you put that on my phone because it, it was on my phone my, it was like a butt dial somehow my phone texted the word namazani and i i'd never heard of it so i had to look it up and now i realize oh this is about memory yes that you know according to jennifer he told me that he said yes that's why i put it there so you could look this up so you could understand this so uh, the question really is is why are we learning about this now We've been on the planet for how many but, hundreds of thousands of years? But I actually haven't, if you really think about it, and that's what popped into my head, that when, we're, when, we're, when life is good, we really don't learn a lot. We're just having a good time. But when we have our worst times or deaths and the yeah. accidents Stress. and strategies is when we learn about ourselves the best, where we come together as human beings, where we, wow, I, did, I can't believe I overcome, overcame that. So I think that's where, because that's where we really learn. And I think you're absolutely right. And, and this is a university. We yeah. come here to learn lessons. And if we screw up in class, we can come back and take that class again. So you, you could argue that if what we're saying is true, that people's consciousness is about to change, that there's some kind mm -hmm. of a shift going on with people's consciousness, that will be proof in the pudding because then we will be conversing 
with people who are no longer in our frequency. And you say that they say that that veil is thinning. That correct. So that we are, in fact, having more of this communication. Correct. Like you say also that people didn't talk about this as often as they do now. Look, yeah. we're having it on our it's little It's the show. Internet. It's really the Internet as a way, the Internet and the Ethernet, as somebody put it, those two things are communicating with each other. So we're allowed, we're not going to get burned at the stake at the end of today. Right. Knock on wood. <laughs> but it took us 100,000 years to get to this conversation which is the natural order of things. We think of it as a long time, but over there it's like, eh. Even though it's a short time, you would think that our spirit guides would nudge us over to be cleaner on Earth. You would think. You would think. <laughs> all right, now, number two, we've got two more. Um, the, you, so you know all about Amelia Earhart, and you talked about that earlier. Yes. <laughs> Why is it that Rich, Rich Martini doesn't go on CNN at 8 o'clock this Saturday night and have you can communicate with her. Why not do this on primetime TV, go on communication with her, or get Jimmy Hoff out there and say, hey, where's the body? And then have somebody dig it up and say, see, this is real. I just talked to Jimmy Hoffa. He said the body's here. They dig it up, and there it is. Give me time. So in my case, no, I mean, look, just like anything, if I go call up CNN and go, look, I can talk to – no, I don't talk to Amelia Earhart. As a Philip Noyce, the film director, once introduced me, he said, this is Rich. He thinks he talks to dead people. I said, no, Philip. I talk to people who talk to dead people. Right? <laughs> okay, well, fair enough. So I'm talking <laughs> to Jennifer. So, and, you know, let's say, but let's say we, let's say we have a panel. We go on CNN, and I have six different mediums. And each one of them, I know their work. I'm very familiar with who they are. And I'm asking them specific questions. And then, you know, we have a real-time crew sitting in Saipan where she right. where she died correct and we have where her electra is buried those things have all been made known to me within the past eh, two years I was in Saipan actually standing where the electra was okay hmm. we had run out of money to dig it up let's put it that way ultimately I came back thinking oh I'm gonna present this I'm gonna tell hey I know and they all look at you like uh, come on nobody cares nobody saw the Hillary Smack nobody cares movie. that would be a huge story I agree but you know what it's me and you <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> tune it in I you know they asked me to work on the Amelia Earhart uh, episode on History Channel those guys I was part of the sizzle reel because I gave them all my information but ultimately we just couldn't agree on a figure what they wanted to pay me for 30 years of work. And I was like, you know what, guys, you don't need me. Just go ahead. And so they did the show. There was a photograph that one of the investigators had found of Amelia on this dock at Jalowit. And then the next day, these guys came out and said, oh, no, that book, that photograph was in a book and I, you know, published in 1935. And they proved in 36 it was Correct. there. Right, yeah. However, mm -hmm. that's not accurate. And I put all that information on Earhart on Saipan, where I have a letter from the you know the the government of Jalowit, um, that island that that place is on. I'm thinking I'm not thinking of it at the moment, but they the Marianas where they said uh, actually the docks weren't built until 1936. So if there's a book, and the, and the truth is that wasn't a book. It was a actually a portfolio of photographs. So the portfolio had been copyrighted, but the librarian told a researcher that I know that they always put new photographs in. So no yeah. book was ever published. So it's syntax. When you use words that are inaccurate, and I try not to. In but my you research. see my point. If you if you, you you guys could prove this to to because most of the world's gonna go, this is complete nonsense. I totally agree with you. And so <laughs> believe me, every time <laughs> Amelia shows up in one of our conferences or sessions, she's like have you taken it to Netflix yet? You know, oh, so I, she's even yeah, for it because oh, she has said through somebody to you that yes. that my dental records will match. Well, then let's dig it up, show the things, and then attribute it to this. Yeah, make people the whole world. Would come I on totally board. agree. Let's do it. Good, Tony. You get the funding started. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Number I'm three, an email and, right and now. And what do they call this, Tony? In in, in, in my list of questions, when you're shooting a film and you're shooting that last scene, you call it a what? The martini. Beautiful. There we go. <laughs> Richard Martini, let me ask you this one. It seems to me uh, it's such a potential for the human race to, to have this contact with the brethren that are in between lives, that, that we're able to contact them and speak with them. Now, I know we can't affect the future by asking them because of our free will, but the past is the past, even though they're outside of time. Our past is our past. Couldn't we ask them 
to tap into the Akashic Record and give us some of these answers like, why don't you ask them, hey, who built the pyramids? When did they build the pyramids? How did the dinosaurs die? Why, why don't we ask them these questions? Or what is, who is God? All right. I have answers for all of those. <laughs> um, but yes, I totally agree with you. And that's part of the basis of my research, which is I suggested this back in 2012 when I was at the University of Virginia. Why don't I gather a, a group of physicists? Because often people under deep hypnosis claim they're in a classroom or somewhere where they're talking about these deep physics and they're drawing things on a chalkboard that the person who's doing the, the reading, reading well, the person who's in the session, yeah. they have no idea what they mean. Right. So and I, my, my idea was let's have a think tank. And what you do is you have people uh, like a private organization funds the think tank, right? And you do these sessions with scientists. You bring them in and you have them do a between life session. And you ask them, hey, how do we turn salt water to fresh water for pennies? Hmm. How do we do things that will change the environment? I love this. And this so, is exactly where I'm at. So, right. uh, so And I, I totally agree with you, which is I think these are questions that we can help save the planet today. How can we help these people do the kind of work that they need? And the point is, even if it's your subconscious coming up with the answer, let's just pretend that that's the case. What's the difference? Right. If you can patent something that's going to change the planet out of this think tank, just imagine how that'll change the planet. And if it's not your subconscious, it is in fact the souls. They 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 want to help us. Absolutely. So, but and then further, the question about the the mids and you know other stuff. You know, I I think those answers are accessible. But what I found in this research, I try to focus on people that I either knew, I met, or that Jennifer knew or met, or that Luana. New or met because you want to be able to verify it. You want to yes. be able to double check. Well, and it. apparently not only that. I mean, that's kind of that's been helpful because you know when they say you know my grandma Betty was the person who greeted me when I crossed over, I can ask them you know did you have a grandma Betty? Yeah. In my case, so I'm the construct that I'm doing with Jennifer now is that we have a classroom, and the people in the class are moderated by Luana Anders, my friend who passed away who was in the classes that I, and whenever Jennifer and I meet, the first person we talk to is Luana, and we go, who's here? And then Jennifer will say the person, often, whose name I invoked that morning on the way to the <laughs> session, and she'll say, uh, Sidney Pollack is here, because I had wow. said his name. Now, I met Sidney, I knew Sidney, I wasn't a close friend of Sidney's, but I knew him well enough that I can ask him questions about his journey, his path, you see? So though, so now when you go back to the mids and, like, who designed the mids, there has to be at least a connection. But I must say this, in, in the case where I'll say to Jennifer, can we ask for so-and-so to show up here today? Can Luana? And she'll say, Luana just grabbed him. And I think, how'd you do that? And then she says, well, I see a grid, like, of light bulbs or lights and it's like a huge grid. Everyone's connected. So it's just a matter of reaching out to the right to the right one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all right. So then so then you go JFK, you know, whatever, whatever it is you want to find out the truth to. You know, there's also the motivation. Like, what do you want to find out? And again, if if the answer is going to upset or alter the course of the journey that you signed up for, that would be annoying. That's literally the guy turning the lights on in the theater going. It's not <laughs> Romeo. Romeo's going to die. You know, th that upsets everybody else's journey because you've screwed up their path. However, I see that. however, let's say something that's Genghis Khan, you know, the mids or whatever. Who designed what? You know, what's this about? You know, was this related? I think you can ask those questions, but. You know, the chance of See, understanding. I would. If I felt, man, yeah, I had yeah. somebody right here, that's the first thing I'd say. But you don't, but my point is, what whoever answers it, you have to then think, how could they know that? Even if it's somebody on the flip side, they're not omniscient, you see? You think they got a better internet up there than I got. That's you know true. what I'm saying? Well, that's true. They have a better shot at it, but I've learned this. Right. They're not omniscient because I have run into this argument with people who channel entities and they'll say, well, you know, Seth says, and then I think, well, that's great that Seth said that, but Seth only, and pardon me for Seth, you know, believers, whatever. I Listen, whoever. I've seen all, I've seen a lot of those audios and videos of Seth, but the point is Seth says things that are contrary to what other people say. And my feeling is, look, if one person says it, 
maybe, to two people say, well, then it's worth examining. And if you have 100 people say it, well, then you can have kind of get a consensus of what that idea is. Agreed. So, well, unfortunately, Tony, what do you got over there? well, fortunately, we're out of time. But before no. we get out of here, well, I want to have you back because just for Amelia Earhart, I would love to right. have a We could just do a show, a show on, Tony, on that. Right. Uh, but coming up uh, in July that you and Jennifer are going to be having oh, a, thank you, yeah. a conversation with you and Jennifer. So tell us about that. Where can they find out more information? So do me a favor. Tell me uh, what the name of the venue is. It's uh, Colby Spiritual Center uh, in, at, uh, in uh, Los Angeles here. Uh, it's on Saturday, July the 14th. Uh, you and Jennifer are going to be sitting down and talking about uh, the, the flip side and the afterlife. Exactly. And in this case, Jennifer's a person who, you know, and a lot of people like to do this. You come into a room and she'll talk to your relative. She'll give you confirmation about your relative. And you right. can show up and be a completely a skeptic about it right. and ask her these questions and then judge how she does. What I do is I ask your relative questions. I'm not, I don't see them and I'm not aware of them. But I ask her the questions mm. based on this so we can take a little bit of a detour. So let's say, for example, that you had a relative who killed himself, right? Right. Your, right. your grandfather, or your dad, or something terrible, tragic. And I don't mean to make light of it at all, but let's pretend that's what you're trying to figure out. Why'd you do that? And so now inst I don't jump in with, why'd you do that? I jump in with, so who was there to greet you when you crossed mm -hmm. over? What was your journey like? Right. Now, in this new book, I talked to some people, like I said, people that I knew. Harry Dean Stanton was an actor, oh, was yeah. an atheist, right. who didn't believe in the afterlife at all. And was famous for that. But I knew Harry. And so when he died, I said to Jennifer, I'd like to talk to a guy named Harry. I didn't tell her who he was at all. And all I told her was his name is Harry Dean. And she said, you know, is that like the sausage guy? No, that's not him. That's Howard. And then, but Harry Dean goes on to describe. Jimmy. No, no, just no, Jimmy kidding. Dean. She, she, he described the journey in such a detailed way how Luana, my friend, had, because they were close friends, how she had made, given him a soft landing. And she constructed a visual. So when he arrived on the flip side, he was in a car with her in 1967, driving to the Monterey Pop Festival. Jennifer knew none of this. I had just learned a month earlier that Harry Dean and Luana and a producer named Fred Roos, who works with the Coppola family, the three of them were in a car together. I didn't know it until a month earlier. So now she's describing this trip. And I say, well, where did you guys go? And she says, she's, they're showing me a concert. And I see uh, Prince is playing. I laughed. Look more carefully. Is that Prince? Oh, my gosh. No, it's Jimi Hendrix. Hendrix. And so and now the, so the, the question was, Harry, so how did you realize this was, uh, this was not real? He, he said, I thought I was in this wonderful dream. He said, because we had a flat tire. How did that? He, she, he said, because I got out of the car and I was fixing the flat tire and I said, wait a second, we didn't have a flat tire on the way to Monterey. And they looked at him and said, we know. And that was the moment he realized he was on the flip side. Wow. Ultimately, I must say, and then I went to his memorial a week later and he had specific messages for people in the room. Stuff like, the medicine you're taking is causing you to dry out. You need to drink more water, such as you need to have your prostate checked. And the guy said, I just had my first treatment today. Nobody knows this. Wow. So I'm just saying he confirmed things that I could not possibly have known. Right. Jennifer right. could not have known. Anyway, the point is <laughs> we're all accessible once we check off the planet. Well, we have to get out here because there's a show getting ready to start. But we this love time went by you, like we were in the was, other on the was. flip side because it only seemed like two minutes, <laughs> right? Richmartini.com and go. You can pick up Amazon on uh, his books on Amazon. Go to his website. We want to have you back again. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, Truth be told, worldwide.com and, and what else? Tomorrow, come see us at Disclosure Fest. Oh yes, Disclosure in Fest in Los Angeles. So until then, oh. I'm Tony Sweet with Captain Ron and Rich Martini. Until next Jared. time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Oh my